Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. I'm going to talk today about the power of networks uh, and the challenge of mapping an increasingly complex world. Uh, and I'm actually going to start with the, the, this talk with uh, trees. Trees have actually been you know, really important religious symbols over the ages. But even more than religious symbols, trees have really been important knowledge classification uh, systems throughout the ages as well, mapping a variety of aspects, mapping the blood ties between people, and even mapping, of course, the species, the various species in the planet, and again, using the tree metaphor on and on and on. In fact, this widespread metaphor, it's so, so, so popular because it really expressed this human desire, this human desire for order, for symmetry, for hierarchy, for simplicity, for balance and unity. Trees are really an embodiment of, of human desire in many ways, in the, way, in the way that, the simple way we like to look at the world. And on the left side, you actually see one of the oldest trees of knowledge known to man, this was actually devised by Aristotle himself, uh, this beautiful tree of knowledge that tries to come up with a universal structure for everything that we know uh, across the world, you know, from, from living bodies, animals to humans. Uh, this was actually again devised by Aristotle himself, and this was considered to be the first tree of knowledge, but then, of course, we have grown a lot more uh, knowledge since then. Uh, we are really facing a paradigm shift, a paradigm shift in the sense that trees are now no longer able to really accommodate the inherent complexities of the modern world. And this happens, of course, for, for a series of reasons. Uh, one of the best uh, articles I've read on this topic has been, uh, was written by Warren Weaver. And in 1948, he wrote an article uh, on the topic of organized complexity. And Weaver basically divided modern science into three different stages. The first one covering the 17th, 18th, and 19th century to what Weaver considered to be problems of simplicity uh, moving to the second stage of modern science, uh, you know, scientists really became aware that it's not just you know, one or two elements going on. There's a lot more elements in our planet. But to some extent, the way that they were sort of connected were, was fairly chaotic, uh, very random. Uh, at least it was thought during that time, uh, discovering at least the first half of the 20th century uh, to what we were considered to be problems of disorganized complexity. Moving, of course, to the end of the 20th century and the current century where we are now, Scientists, of course, became much, much more aware. It's not just a huge variables going on. There's not just a huge number of elements in our planet, but they are also highly interconnected and highly interdependent to what, to what Weaver considers to be problems of organized complexity. We can see those problems of organized complexity in the way we try to unravel our ecosystems. So no more we have this you know, extremely simplified predator versus prey diagrams, right? We are understanding our ecosystems in a much more complex way. This is a diagram of all the species that interact with cod off the coast of northeastern Canada. We also see these problems of organized complexity in the way we try to decode our own brain. Before, we used to think about the brain as this modular, centralized organ where a different area was responsible for a given set of actions or behaviors. It's kind of appealing to think about the brain as a central element responsible for a variety of, of actions. But of course, it's not central at all. The more we realize that you know, our brain is really almost like a music symphony played by hundreds and thousands of instruments. This is one of the most complex maps of the brain, and it's mapping 10,000 neurons. It's mapping 30 million connections with, with, between those neurons. Uh, and it's just 10% of the human neocortex. We also see this, these problems of organized complexity in the way we categorize knowledge. This is one of the most beautiful trees representations. This was created for the French encyclopedia created by Diderot and d'Alembert, you know, the, the big sort of encyclopedia of, of enlightenment. But even though it was brilliant at the time, 1751, it really represents knowledge as a, tr as a tree where branches don't really touch each other, right? I mean, they touch in the diagram, but they, no, they don't. They have no connections. They have no ties between them. It's individual branches that branch off and no, there's no connection whatsoever. In comparison, these are two maps of Wikipedia. And Wikipedia, of course, all of you know, it's, it's really one of the largest rhizomatic structures ever created by man. You know, by looking at these maps, and of course using Wikipedia as we have 
done probably several times already, that knowledge is really highly interconnected, is you know, just like a network, really. I mean, you can actually see here some topics like mathematics and others, and they have immense connections with other disparate uh, areas of knowledge, apparently disparate, but sharing a lot of ties. We also see problems of organized complexity in the ways we try to classify information. This has been a problem that has been going on for ages and ages. You know, it goes back all the way you know, from uh, ancient Greece, but also in the Middle Ages, where we were trying to come up with ways of categorizing all the new information that was coming from the Arab world. And what's interesting enough is that we always use the, team, the tree metaphor again to map knowledge, to map information. In this case, what you see on the left is an example of the Dewey Decimal System. And, uh, and this system is one of the, the most common systems in most, most libraries. And as most, most of those systems, they are highly hierarchical. They are you know, just a top-down structure where you can drill down all the way to the individu individual categories, all the way from the top to bottom. And again, not sharing any ties, any connections whatsoever between those categories. But of course, information is way much more diverse. These are, again, two maps of delicious. I don't know if you in the audience have ever used delicious, but delicious is a very popular social bookmarking system. So basically, anyone can just you know, uh, save their bookmarks, their favorite URLs into the system, and tag and categorize them in different ways. And the beauty of that is that collectively, by, being, by this system being used by millions of users, it's providing us great insights on how human beings categorize information uh, from a collective point of view. And again, it doesn't resemble a, a tree at all. It is really a network in, in, many, in many different ways. Uh, we also see these problems of organized complexity in the way we try to organize ourselves. This notion of, of top-down hierarchies became so prevalent in you know, institutions, society, companies, governments, etc. But this is you know, the typical organization chart you know, where, again, the top-down all the way from the president to the individual uh, workman down below. But of course, we are much more idiosyncratic beings, as we all know. And the internet is really drastically changing this paradigm of looking at social structures from a hierarchical point of view, a tree structure. This is a map uh, of online social collaboration between Perl developers. And Perl is a very famous programming language. And here you can actually see thousands of, of people collaborating in, in a variety of projects. We also see this kind of paradigm shift in the, in the way we look at, or at, at nature, right? in the way we order nature itself. So the image that you have on the left side, as a big fan of Darwin myself, this is actually the only illustration that Darwin had in The Origin of Species, what he denominated to be the tree of life. And of course, since then, you know, in, over the past 150 years, many scientists have evolved this tree of life. Very recently, scientists really discovered that overlaying this tree of life, the original tree of life by Darwin, we, there is a dense network of bacteria, and ba this bacteria is actually tying very disparate species and making them really close together. And if you consider that roughly 90% of the human body is made of bacteria in our cells, you can really understand the significance of this discovery. And a lot of scientists are really calling this the web of life. It's not the, the tree of life anymore, it's the web of life, it's the network of life. Networks are truly everywhere. It is this omnipresent structure, the brain, is a network of nerve cells connected by axons. Cells themselves are, of course, networks of molecules. Societies, as we all know, are networks of, of people linked by different types of ties. Of course, on a larger scale, you can think about food webs and ecosystems, as we saw before, as networks of species. And of course, it, it really pervade, random networks pervade human technology from the internet, power grids, and transportation systems. What is also interesting when you have like so many projects collected into one unique database is that you have you find out a lot of interesting patterns arising through that database. One of the key sort of emerging trends has been trying to map the blogosphere, this collective body of knowledge that by collectively, uh, by all the blogs out there, right? And the most common sort of map that people create is the one that you see on number one, which is you know, the political network of, of US blogs. And the reason they do that is to somehow try to understand if by mapping the, link, uh, the linkage between political blogs, Democrat and Republicans, they are able to somehow predict the result of an election. Number three is actually one of the most interesting projects uh, done in this, in this area, blogosphere. And this was actually trying to map the most active areas of, of the blog space. And you see some key nodes, right? You see some hubs, like number one, dailycause.net, number two, boingboing.net, two of the most popular blogs. 
But what's really interesting is number three that you can see on the top right. And the author was really intrigued how that island was really isolated from the rest of the blogosphere. And it turned out it was primarily users of LiveJournal. And LiveJournal is very similar to WordPress, a blogger. Uh, it's just a blogging tool. But it tends to be used primarily by teenagers. And what's interesting again about that from a sociological point of view is that teenagers, they are all interconnected between themselves, but they don't really create outbound ties. So you end up having this tally close-knit island isolated from the rest of the blogosphere. And this is, again, the type of, of outcome that can only exist through this network analysis. And finally, across these examples, uh, terrorism. Uh, most of us, of course, know how, how much money and time has been invested in trying to decipher terrorism. And because it's such a flattened structure, such a network topology, it's really, really challenging to understand it. So that's why the visualization is becoming an immense tool to understand it. On number three is one of the most fascinating sort of visual mechanisms that they, they found to understand who are the people responsible in that network. This is actually the terrorist cells involved in the Madrid attacks uh, uh, a few years back, I think seven years ago. So what they did is that they segmented the network in three years, right? So the, the three layers that you see, the vertical layers, they represent different years. And they map all the people present year after year. And the blue lines tie the people that were present year after year. So even though there's no leader per se, they can probably identify the people that stayed for a long period of time in that network. So probably those people will be the ones that know more about the network. They know more about the plans. They have more influence within that particular cell, in, within that particular network. But what's also incredibly interesting to me uh, is also how in the process of us, designers, scientists, researchers, trying to map a variety of complex systems, we are in turn influencing a lot of artists, and artists from traditional fields like painting and sculpture. And networks are really become, becoming a, a cultural meme in their own right. Uh, we could even argue, is this the birth of a new movement? Is this the birth of networkism? The one on the left is a computer-generated map of IP addresses, servers, basically. And on the right is uh, a painting by Sharon Malloy, beautiful painting called All on Animal and Canvas. Uh, and again, the influence is, is, is quite striking. This is one of my favorite projects of all times. It's, and the title really says it all. It's called Galaxies Forming Along Filaments Like Droplets Along the Strands of a Spider's Web. And this is a beautiful installation by Thomas Saraceno, where he fills huge rooms with this network structure. What's interesting, I've, I've never actually went to one myself, but I've read quotes of people who've been there. And apparently, because everything is made of elastic rubs, once you bounce into a specific rope, the whole network adapts. It kind of changes like a real network in many ways. So it's really fascinating, fascinating project. Throughout your book, you have a reference to we. You know, this idea of we are allured mm. by depictions of complex mm. networks. When you say this we, who is this we? Do you think this applies to everyone? Or? I, th I think it does. I think there's, so in, on the book itself, there's a, yeah, it's my favorite chapter. It's called Complex Beauty. And what's interesting is that I found this work of this physicist who actually uh, analyzed Pollock's work in a really deep level. And he's a physicist, right? Uh, it's probably the, the most sort of opposite of an art critic that you can imagine. And he looked at, at Pollock's work, and he actually determined that Pollock's, a lot of these paintings, actually showcase fractal properties uh, in many different ways. And he explains, he goes into detail why that is. And what's interesting is that he creates this hypothesis that maybe one of the reasons that so many people are drawn into the Pollock's paintings is the same way we are drawn into so many areas of nature, because nature uh, showcases fractals in a variety of circumstances. And maybe it was actually uh, equating that maybe we have this inherent sort of appeal for structures that have some sort of fractal properties. And, and some of these networks definitely showcase some of those properties. So it is kind of interesting, maybe, I mean, again, it's not confirmed scientifically that, that that's the case, but it is kind of an hypothesis that makes it at least interesting to consider, right? Does that actually then maybe bring us a bit of a problem? So something else you mentioned in the book is this idea of patternicity. So mm. it's a human tendency to, to see patterns beautiful, in things. Beautiful. So they did that if you see a picture, you understand it because you feel the pattern. You know, work has been done that people, if they look at a network without any training, will tend to see the core and isolates. But is there a danger with having all these m amazing pictures that you argue we are drawn to if then our core human thing is to see a pattern that may or may not be there? It's been one of the most common sort of ideas that beauty lies in simplicity, you know, in unity, in, uh, in the sense of balance, right? And networks represent almost the, the opposite of all of that. 
But it's an idea that I would like really to contest. You know, after so many centuries, I think, are we in the presence of an alternative side to beauty, right? So when we look at nature, nature is not perfect. It's not by any means, right? It's not simple by any means. And we still find it increasingly attractive in, in many different areas of nature. And it's interesting, like you're saying, paternicity is an amazing thing where we look at things and, and some people, perhaps not so trained in the art field, they look at, and, and at paintings and they always in, immediately try to see something. You know, if it's a glass, what does it represent? I don't understand it. I don't grasp what it is. But sometimes that's not the point. Sometimes it's, it's, it's that lack of, of simplicity that's fascinating in its own right. And uh, so you see that the networks are representing, and I really believe that networks, and again, go back to that, that idea of fractals and so on, it's, it's, they are in many ways representing an alternative conception of beauty uh, in many ways. Through this attempt to allow people to understand networks further because they are a map of themselves, something we're examining is how people need to understand complexity because complexity is essentially how the social world works. We're taught that A and plus B equals C, but that's not actually how that, that works at kind of a more complex level. And something you touch on, not in the talk, was how order and disorder, or kind of order and complexity, are actually two poles of the same phenomena, and almost a problem of scale. If you're in a riot, it feels very chaotic. If you're out the riot, you can actually see the patterns going on. So could you maybe explain a bit further what you meant by that, by order and disorder being the same thing, but at a different scale? And that links, obviously, to the last oh, slide, yeah, which was fascinating. Absolutely. So science went through the same process, you know, trying to understand a, a while back, you know, the ideas of, you know, and, and again, the idea of chaotic theories, you know, complex theories, they all changed this drastic aspect, that simplicity and complexity, they were opposite sides of, 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 the, of the spectrum. And this has been the case throughout you know, centuries and, and millennia as well. But recently, and again, case theory was critical, complex theory was critical in science to really understand that they, it's what they called uh, a complex, um, what did they call it? Uh, it's, it's orderly complex, right? And you find that orderly, com orderly complexity in many, many different ways. And chaos is, a, is an example of that. Complexity theory is an example of that. And networks themselves, like you're saying, it's a problem of scale. What do I mean is, if you look deep, into a network, if you look at the most key ingredients, like the node and, and the line, if you zoom into the network, it's extremely simple, right? It's just simplicity duplicated many, 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 many times uh, as fractals, right? It, fractals are just you know, the same pattern duplicated many, many, many times, where that creates complexity, but com that complexity arises from simplicity. So it's just purely duplicating or you know, duplicating several times simplicity in many different formulas, but it is what, it, that, that's a, that idea of simplicity being duplicated to create complexity. And you find that, and of course we are realizing it's not anything new, but science has realized this you know, over the years. And uh, again, evolution is based on a lot of the small changes, you know, creating an, an immense layer of complexity, right? We know of already, already acknowledge that. But, but art, surprisingly, has been a little bit more reluctant to sort of acknowledge that process of, of disorderly uh, uh, order. And I think now it's changing. I think the beauty of, of a lot of these new artists is that they're really understanding that networks are incredibly fascinating from an aesthetic point of view. Uh, and they're equally fascinated by many scientists to, again, uncover these this, this inherent challenges of, of these uh, immensely complex systems as well.